All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning everyone. Hey. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Keith Brooks from the Education Department, but I'm here as a faculty development representative. And welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. Uh, Prime Time at the BU Library's mission is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for faculty, students, and staff through its presentations, which are a collaboration of many different offices on campus with the friends of the BU Library. Be sure to join us on next Tuesday, February 15th, for Egrin Scholars Trey Maddox and Caitlin Oden as they present their research on template directed synthesis for the regulation of gene expression. All right. <laughs> All right. And on Thursday, February 17th, we will be announcing the 2011 Library Research Prize winners and presenting last year's winner with our new Library Research Prize Traveling Trophy. Ooh, wow. Ooh, right. That's pretty major. Yeah, yeah sounds like a big deal. Uh, but today, please help me welcome our uh, faculty award winner for education, Dr. Jay Rasmussen. Thanks everyone for being here. I appreciate it. I've got a lot of friends here and some folks I don't know, but uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being here today. Um, this will be the first part of a four-part series. Are we getting weird sound right now? Yeah. yeah. Bob, anything I need to do? Okay. You're fine. Um, kind of the first part of a four-part series. The, the total series is really called Strategies for Increasing Student Engagement. And um, this is really the first first segment of that series. We'll be looking at the idea of kind of why you know, should these strategies be used in any way. Uh, next one will be March 10th then, and we'll be looking at really ways to overcome some of the obstacles you know, that uh, professors might feel in using strategies to engage students. Sometimes we have to overcome obstacles that students might have you know, to being engaged in the learning process. And then uh, April 14th, um, we'll be specifically connecting some strategies with lecture. Uh, I think all of us at some point in time do some lecturing. You know, as college professors, we've got a few. K-12 people here as well too, but we all do some stand and deliver. You know, so how can we engage in that process as well? And then uh, May 5th, the last one, uh, be looking at really how to how to connect people with uh, content area text a little bit better. Some strategies for that too. So uh, if you enjoy today, and if you feel like you can put up with me for another session or a few more sessions, please come and encourage encourage your colleagues to come as well too. That would be great. Um, we're going to be doing some things with partners here today a little bit. Um, also, we'll do some large group discussion as well, too. But I want to start you off just with, uh, with a partner here, kind of getting comfortable. Um, a lot of you know the person you're sitting next to. I know enough of, enough of you to figure this part out. But some of you don't know uh, the person seated next to you. So if you don't have somebody close to you right now that you can talk to, maybe you could just shift a little bit. Um, but kind of figure out who your, who your partner is going to be in some way, if you could. Let's do that. Sure. Yeah. 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 I'll take Are you already going to put me up? I can pull up I can pull up here by you. <laughs> okay, here's your task, right? Yeah. Let's, uh, in your handout packet, if you could, and this would be kind of the, uh, I guess it's a bluish colored one. Um, let's turn to the first page there. On top of it, it says quotables there. What I'd like you to do is take a look through. You've got about four pages of quotes here. Kind of skim through fairly quickly. And what I'd like you to do is find a quote that you think really best describes you know, what you think to be true about teaching and maybe something that you actually do put into practice you know, occasionally too. So I'd like you to identify that quote that you think best typifies your beliefs, your practices as a teacher. And then I'd like you to share that quote with your partner and tell them what the quote is and then kind of why you picked it. Why is that a reflection of you, you know, as a teacher? Okay. Anybody not clear on that at all? One more time, Jay? One more time. Take a quick look through the quotes. You've got about four pages of them. Pick one. Just pick one that you think best typifies your beliefs, your practices as a teacher. And then share that with that one other person that you're seated next to. And talk about why you, know, you picked that quote. Okay? And introduce yourself, too, if you don't know that person. You'll start with that. Okay? So let's just begin with that, if you could.
I borrow some of these, Jay? Mm -hmm. They are yours. find one that you like a lot before you get through all four, that's fine too. But if you could fairly soon kind of talk to your partner here. <laughs> all right. We're working with limited time. Okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. All right. I like this one. A mediocre teacher. There. Good teacher explain. A superior teacher demonstrates. Great teacher. I love the growing. I love that. That's what I try to do. So, you know, you, you can't go with everything. So I'm trying to push them to take initiative to plant a positive seed in them as they become to know that the student is the more important You're more important than whatever I'm trying to say. You know, I'm going to do something that inspires them, to empower them, to lead them to all areas. So, to be great, there's a great story that I'm going to do. And Take about another two minutes or so. Another two minutes. See how Plato or Arthur gets quoted. Is there not to say, okay, I love the above's a great teacher, so I'm going to be like, oh, so many people will jump into experiences that are in some fundamental way that should have some teacher, but they don't they don't have a practice you really can't be thinking about it So if you don't think that part of the educational process and make part of the teaching for the teaching. Right. Exactly. So you know, yes, it's important to learn how to do things. No but it's also important to study right? <laughs> And, um, and then I think about what yeah. you know, yeah. 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 ask me the questions about what you said as well. Why did you do that? Why did that work? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we have to be. Those are important questions. Good. Why? Thinking. That's good. That's good. Could you? We're going to pull back together again if we could here. Um, if I can get your attention. We've, uh, we've gotten a quick start in this first packet that you have. And this has given us a, kind of a quick agenda of what we're going to do in this first session here. And what you'll notice is uh, each, with each of the topics, for most of them, there's uh, something that's italicized right at the end. And that's a particular activity you know, that we might be jumping into. So we just did one called quotables here. In a second, we're going to be involved in an activity just called a simple partner share. We'll do that. And then uh, we'll be in an activity that's called the listening teams as well, too. You'll notice after listening teams, there's a number there. It says number 32. That particular number is referencing uh, something that's cited in the green packet that you have. And this is a collection of roughly 70 different strategies that you could consider you know, to actively engage your student. So throughout the four, I'll be trying to use a number of the strategies so you can see what they feel like and so forth. But anytime you see a number, it's, it's referencing uh, a particular strategy in this handout. 
I'm not going to go through how to do these strategies. You'll kind of see some of them, you know, see what they feel like from a student's perspective. But I would really encourage you to keep this uh, near where you do your planning, whether you're a college teacher. We've got a lot of K-12 teachers in here, too. But keep it near a place where you do a lot of your planning. And when you're kind of stuck for an idea on how I can get students engaged in some way, uh, you've got a real host of ideas here. We've actually got a group now, it's 77 faculty that are field testers of a lot of these strategies. So a lot of these things are happening you know, within Bethel at this time. But these are, uh, these are some ones that have proven to be successful, kind of in the trenches. Okay, that's where I think they come from. So today I won't be referencing this one much, but it is a resource for you. If you want it online, send me an email. I'd be happy to send it to you. And if you keep coming to the sessions, bring this with you if you could. I don't want to you know, give new ones out every single time we're doing this. So bring it with you if you could. Um, let's just take a look at really the next area that we're going to move to, which is that idea of really defining what we mean you know, by, uh, by engaged learning. So let's, uh, let's just deal with that. Um, I use the term engaged learning. Uh, in the research, the term that's used most commonly is active, is active learning. And uh, now we're starting to have a few more people use the term engaged learning. And I'll kind of explain why I like that term better. But, you know, the historical roots of this whole idea of actively engaging people, you know, go back to the definition that we've got here. And you have this in your packet as well. And uh, this is back to 1991, kind of our first thought, you know, about what it means to actively engage learners. And, you know, it's pretty simplistic. You know, it involves students doing things and thinking about what they're doing. Okay, that was kind of some of the first definitional work that was done. The definition I actually like the best right now is really represented best, I think, schematically, you know, versus just words necessarily. And uh, this is a definition that comes from a person named D. Fink. I think it's 2003 or so. And uh, a contrast was drawn between just passive learning, you know, where theoretically the student is sitting there you know, just taking in, you know, all this great wisdom that we have for them. And boy, they're just soaking everything in. And uh, the contrast is drawn to the idea that, you know, thinking that really our students truly are more active learners. Um, often they, they function best when they're not in that passive role. And uh, D. Fink really breaks it up into a couple, couple areas. First of all, there needs to be some type of experience, you know, that the students have it. And that experience can be something that they're doing, for example. Now that doing could be something they're writing, something they're reading, you know, something they're saying, something they are physically doing. Uh, it can even be listening, it can be observing. So there's some type of experience you know, that that student is engaged in. Right now, we have an experience of sorts that's going on. It's kind of changing you know, by the minute. But then I think the key part that really bears attention is the, the importance of reflection you know, on, that, you know, on that experience that the student is having. And uh, I really like to kind of focus on the idea of you know, the student really thinking about what they're learning, how they're learning it, but then also recognizing that the, the, the depth of the reflection can really come when it's done individually, but it also can really come when that reflection is done with someone else's too, with someone else. So that idea of the act of learning, it's not just about the doing, the doing of it, but it's also about really the reflection on whatever it is that's happening. Um, Samuel Zalanga has been, wrote a little bit just a little while ago on C faculty about interim trips and what are the benefits and you know, what are the kind of pitfalls potentially of interim trips. Talked a lot about that idea for reflection, you know, just how critical that is. So in any event, when, I, when we're talking about active learning, when we're talking about engaged learning, this is what I'm really talking about. Okay? It's not just somebody doing something. I mean, there's, there's more to it than that. Okay? I'd, like, I'd like you, well, let's take a look at this quote real quick here, too. And you've got this one in your, in your packet. Why don't you just kind of read through it if you could? Kind of the second part of that, that concept, then, <clears throat> is the idea of really that reflection alone and then with others. Why don't you take a look at this one, too, if you would. Again, that's in your packet, packet as well.
So I'd like us to think about if this really rings true with real experience, okay, with your experiences. So let's, let's think about that a little bit. What I'd like you to do is think about what I'm just calling a significant learning event in your life. Okay, think of a time in your life when you were just, it was powerful. There was just, you could just feel almost, you know, some real learning taking place. And then I'd like you to talk with your partner a little bit about how were you engaged at that time? Was it reading? Was it writing? Was it speaking? You know, was it doing something? You know, what was it? Think about how you were engaged. Then I'd like you to talk a little bit about what kind of reflection may have been connected to that. And think, was there a lone reflection? Was there reflection with others? Um, I'll just give you an example of this. Um, if I were to take, like just for myself, probably, a, probably the most powerful learning time for me was a time that um, I received a Fulbright Award to um, conduct research in Norway at the University of Oslo. So for six months, I literally moved my entire family to Oslo, Norway. I had a third grade son who was put in Norwegian schools, didn't speak Norwegian. Had an eighth grade daughter who was put in middle school, Norwegian school, didn't speak Norwegian. My wife, who's Mexican American, okay, is now moving to Norway, you know, for six months. Okay, this was a major learning experience for us on every, you know, every possible, um, in every possible way, culturally and, and otherwise. Um, we had, our learning event was 24 hours a day. It was like everything we did, you know, we were immersed in this learning event. We were engaged. Um, we did a lot of thinking, reflecting alone. My daughter would sit in her room and think about what's going on here. My son, and I would as well. But often, both Roberta and I and our kids actually felt that we didn't really fully appreciate that experience, get everything we could out of that experience until after it was completely over, we were back in the United States, and we wound up talking to some other people that had lived in Norway. We just started sharing experiences about the culture and university life and some of those kind of things. So for me, anyhow, major engagement, there was that kind of a loan, that other component as well, too. But for you, if you could identify a time when you felt just like, man, there's a lot of learning that's taking place here. If you could talk to that same partner, kind of describe that a little bit, and then talk about that role of reflection. You know, was it really there, that alone part and that with somebody else? Okay? So when you're ready, why don't you go ahead and, and talk with your partner. Okay. Anybody need a partner yeah. still here at all? Yeah. Good. Um, get you really down. What you're doing is hard to do. I'm like, really, I'm just following the rules. I don't know what I'm That's all. Just do it. Don't worry about the camera. Oh, wow. And there was a lot of journal. So I wrote things down. So that's your question. I reflected in the journal, but then of course she and I had some shared experiences. So that's in the movie, for example, where there's a nice synergy between something you're by yourself. And then of course your own view of what you're learning. We reflect that day together. So here's kind of what I got out of it. Here's what I got out of it. Oh, I never really thought of it that way. So that's that's great. It's impossible to grow. We are around my own writing and being a little bit more around it. Because I'm not surprised when I remember the day I wrote it on the side. It was kind of all of it. I discovered it was pretty dangerous. But then I learned it was that writing. Yeah, you know, you know, so you know, 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 you
That's amazing. You were like one. That's like I wrote a paper and I then Whoa! Yeah, yeah. Obviously, that was learning that was both. A lot of stuff. You know, like throwing back. Right, right. Also, it was part of the party. It was like a 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 party. It was like a
just it's bogus. This Rasmussen guy does not know what he's talking about. There's this is just messed up. Okay, so we're going to have our naysayers. I'm going to start. Up, I'm going to start here. Go to Kat, and then we'll go back. And you guys are in this game too. You don't get out of it just by standing there, All right? So you're going to you're going to be the naysayers then. All right, and then the other folks, you know, starting with Deb here, going over. I'd like you to think of examples in some way that connect, you know, to what we're taking a look at here. All right. So we've got our agreeers over here. We've got our naysayers over here, and we've got our example givers over here. Okay, I am going to stand and deliver for a little bit. So as you're kind of working through this, as you're thinking about it, kind of consider your role, obviously, something you're agreeing with and, and so forth. Um, but just at this point, just try to just try to wrestle with it, you know, with the content. And then we're going to start here with some thoughts then too. All right? The basic, the basic model that I'm going to talk about is the information processing model. And um, I'm going to use this, you know, as a model that I think explains pretty well how we as humans learn. Right? And there's different names for this model. This model dates back actually to 1954, believe it or not. A guy named William Nesser wrote a book on, called Cognitive Psychology. Uh, he proposed this model at that point, and since then researchers have been adding bits and pieces, bits and pieces, you know, to what he had to say. I think the model still holds up pretty well, you know, even at this time. Within this model, there are some, uh, some basic ideas that are held. And one of them would be the idea that, that learning is an active process. It's not just that passive thing where we thought we were just infusing all this information. But we're finding the greater, they call it the depth of processing, the greater the depth of processing, you know, the more learning you know, really takes place. That's a basic idea, fundamental to the model. Also the idea that, that we as humans use reasoning in the learning process. When we hear something, when we experience something, we try to make sense of it. We try to make sense of it. And often when we don't make sense of it, it's not, it's not just working with us, we wrestle with it. That's cognitive dissonance, you've heard that. We're just thinking about it, we're just, how does this fit? You know, we try to make sense of our world. I mean, that's how God has created us. Another basic idea is that prior knowledge is key. You know, Plato said we learn nothing new independent of what we already know, okay? And in a sense, what we know is built, you know, is built on the foundation of something. It's not just new learning, you know, void, you know, of connections, you know, to something in the past. I'm sure you've had experiences, too, where you've tried to teach students something new. That prior knowledge wasn't there. That foundation wasn't there. And it's really difficult. It's like trying to build the second floor of your house, and you don't have the first floor finished. You know, so we're finding that prior knowledge is key. We're also finding that if there's improper prior knowledge, something's learned wrong the first time, it takes a long time to, for somebody to relearn that. But we need to know if that, is that prior knowledge there before we can really move forward. And then the basic idea that there really are some steps that we go through when we're learning something. And that's really what the information processing model is. And you've got this, this uh, slides in your handout packet. And basically what the model talks about is that during the learning experience, there's some type of environment you know, that the student's going to be in. This is our environment right now. Okay, we're kind of in the middle of a library, got all kinds of things going on. But this is our environment, you know, one way or the other. Within that environment, there's stimuli. There's certain things you see, certain things you hear. Fortunately, certain things we can smell you know, over here as well, too. But there's stimuli in whatever that environment it is. It doesn't matter where you are. And then our receptors are taking in you know, whatever the stimuli are in that given environment. And that's done through our sensory registers. And uh, our sensory registers, what they say is that everything that we take in, we actually have total recall of for about a quarter of a second, okay, <laughs> about a quarter of a second. And then most of what we took in is gone after that, is just lost. But occasionally we do hold on to something, you know, that we, you know, that we actually take in. And then the part I want to talk maybe the most about is that idea of short-term memory, sometimes called working memory, you know, as well, too, and then long-term memory. Short-term memory, and you've all heard things about this, but it's, uh, it's actually um, good for holding, you know, they say roughly about seven pieces of information at any point in time. And uh, it's kind of plus or minus two, all right? You got a few people at a little more on the nine range, you got a few more people on the five range, but, you know, somewhere around there. And typically, whatever's in short-term memory is good for about 18 to 36 hours, is what they say. So not, not real long, you know. 
Um, so it sounds like short-term memory isn't like very good. You know, it's kind of worthless. It doesn't hold a whole lot of information. But the, the function, one of the functions of short-term memory is that it really, um, at times, uh, at times really is involved in the process of things getting shifted to long-term memory. So ideally, what will happen is things in short-term memory make that shift over to long-term memory. Unfortunately, a lot of times things are just kind of lost, you know, don't make that shift. But uh, it is short-term memory then that, um, that really <coughs> kind of helps us make decisions. It, it really, um, what, it's really what leads to us having some kind of motor response, to kind of doing something, saying something, and so forth. So it's incredibly inefficient in terms of a storage area, but it's particularly helpful because of the role it plays in connecting things to long-term memory, decision-making, that type of thing. Um, the start of semesters, I really don't like them very much because I feel over, overloaded, you know, as a professor. And it's mostly because I'm trying to juggle names, a lot of names, in my short-term memory. And it's very difficult to do. So I'm sure some of you sometimes feel like, man, I can't get anything more in, your, in my short-term memory. And you know what, you're right. I mean, that's a legitimate excuse. It just doesn't hold a lot of things, you know, in the short term. Okay, what I want to talk about the most, though, is how we get things really to long-term memory. Okay, and I'm going to, well, first of all, long-term memory, there are kind of different structures that are connected with it. Uh, we've really got a declarative, a procedural, and more imagery. And just real quick what these are. So long-term memory, you've got kind of facts, generalized information. You've got concepts, principles. These are all things that you have in long-term memory. Then you have an episodic memory. And kind of see what that's involved. Often for something to make it to episodic memory in a sense, it can sometimes be a very brief experience, but often there's a lot of emotion connected to it. Any kind of trauma situations. It, it may have taken place in five seconds, but because of the power of emotion, it's like there you know, forever in a sense. Okay. And then we have a procedural memory. Okay, you have that. Great thing to have. And then you also have an imagery. Okay, it's just the remembering of pictures or images that would be there. Okay, um, this is what I, this will be kind of my take on this a little bit based on a bunch of research and then I am going to show you some specific research too. The odds of really getting something over to long-term memory increase dramatically when first of all the students are seeing the meaning, the meaningfulness of that information. Yeah. And what we're finding is that when students don't see the meaning in what they're doing, they just don't tend to take it in. You know, they just aren't taking it, aren't absorbing it as quickly. Anytime there's meaningful repetition, it's incorporated. And notice that I say meaningful, not just repetition. If you do the same thing over and over and over with your students in the same way, not going to have the impact as if you've got meaningful repetition. It's a little different. We're coming at this a little differently each time. But it's still the same content you know, that we're dealing with. And also when information is chunked, okay, when it's stored, you know, our brain stores information in networks. And uh, when students are seeing information presented in a coherent way where the relationships are clear, perhaps it's a visual aid of some sort, but we're see when they're seeing the relationships, when it's chunked, okay, our brain's a lot more efficient at really storing that information. For example, if I tell you, remember the numbers, one, nine, four, zero, one, nine, four, five, Right? If you remember that by isolated little digits, probably pretty tricky. If I tell you, remember, kind of the start of World War II, the end of World War II, all of a sudden 1940, 1945 becomes a whole lot easier because you know, things are chunked, you know, they're connected together in some way. And then also, a lot of recent research on this, just the value of emotion and how critical that is in the learning process. And I love, I love that quote. And by the way, it's not just any emotion, okay? You can bring fear into your classroom. You can bring intimidation into your classroom. And there's emotions connected to that. Those are going to be counterproductive, you know, by the way. But, uh, but generally speaking, emotions that aren't negative in a sense, you know, do really help in that learning process. And then the idea of, it's just called dual coding, the idea that when students are getting information verbally and visually, you're really, in a sense, doubling the likelihood of things really making it to long-term memory. Because you're, you're making use of the full brain at that point. There's not as much overload you know, on short-term memory. Okay, and then just a couple things real quick and then we're gonna hear your thoughts.
these, uh, these ideas come out of the, a book that uh, we've got, I think we have this one up. Yeah, we actually have this book here in the library. A uh, couple books I'm recommending. And these will reinforce a little bit of what I was just talking about as well. Collaborative rehearsal, where the connections are made with the information. This is in your handout too. Again, when the students are seeing relevance, Motivation, really key. And believe it or not, we as instructors play a pretty big role in that motivation level of students. You can actually get students interested in something they may not naturally be interested in just by catching you know, whatever emotion you bring, excitement you bring about something. When they're actively engaged, They're receiving material multiple ways, multiple times, but in different ways, kind of like I was talking about. Not just the same thing over and over again. Just a couple more. This one's interesting. Pretty recent research on this. Just showing the value of testing, students testing themselves even. The whole emotion thing we were just talking about. And this one's really interesting, too. You know, often that relationship with the teacher is particularly critical. And we're finding, especially students of color and women, that relationship with the teacher is really critical. Okay, I'm going to shoot ahead just a, just a little bit here if I could. Let's, um, let's jump on this a little bit here. Um, we're fighting time here in a lot of ways. But um, I'd like, if we could, let's just hear kind of three chunks of information here. If we could, kind of our agreeers, our disagreeers, our example givers. So let's, uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot fast here to be thinking. But, uh, but how about something that you kind of bought into this group over here? Something that yeah. just kind of rang true in your view. One of the last things you just said about emotion evokes um, or increases interest mm -hmm. or it may make a student care about the information uh, depending upon how your excitement or how you approach the information. Sometimes it spills onto them. About other areas of agreement. I've given you like 30 seconds to reflect on this stuff. <laughs> but, uh, about some other other things you'd agree with, Donna? Well, how short term the short term memory actually is, because mm -hmm. I liked your quote from Plato, mm -hmm. and I didn't get it written down before it had, was gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we learn nothing new, independent of what we already know. So, yeah. Okay, other things you agree with? Yeah. The need to encourage meaning making in yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found too is that particularly that needs to come pretty early in your lesson, whatever you're doing on a given day, because otherwise they're checking out. And just my opinion right now is I think students are even more and more practical. If they don't see how they can use this in some way, uh, they are not fully with you often. A few students will be, because they think you're smart, you're the teacher, I better listen. But an awful lot of them, unless they're sold on the meaning and purpose of what's happening, they're not fully there. Really critical. Okay. All right, let's hear from our naysayers if we could. We've got kind of folks over here. Anything that you just don't buy into in some way? I don't buy into the whole thing about active learning. I'm sorry. But, you know, years ago I interviewed some English majors in college. I hope you know I'm doing my I, I here. Believe <laughs> I don't, I don't know. And education majors. And asked how they like to learn. And the English majors wanted to sit there and take notes on the information that was delivered to them. Mm -hmm. And the education students wanted to work it out. Mm -hmm. So I, I yeah. don't think this is a right for everybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find a lot enough things to, to disagree with. That's my problem. It's, uh, yeah, Kim? Uh, I take a great risk in disagreeing with Plato, but um, <laughs> what, can't we learn new things even if we don't already know something? Where's the role for imagination? What if something really captures our imagination? Even if we don't already know it, don't, wouldn't, if the right stimulus is there, wouldn't we be inspired to learn it? Mm -hmm. Even though we know absolutely nothing about it, have no foundation for it. Yeah, that's good stuff. Good thought. Yep, Lada. Aren't you perpetuating uh, stereotypes of students of color that they need to have that interaction with students? <laughs> okay. 
Fortunately, I know all of you, so I kind of know what you're thinking <laughs> behind some of those comments, <laughs> which is good, but yeah. And I would say with that interaction with students of color that that's really considered a privilege because there haven't, uh, in our history, there haven't been as many uh, uh, teachers and professors of color, and they have still had to exceed and do well, regardless of who's standing in front of them. I agree. Good, good thought. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the wrong right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You have a very vocal disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that right now. Okay. Yeah. I do have one uh, serious uh, and one sort of course. It's World War II. 1940, that was 1939. <laughs> okay. uh, you got me, you got me. Uh, yeah. No, but a little danger in making meaning, If is there a danger in having the professor guide too much on the meaning that's made yeah. so that the students merely parrot the meaning that the professor has already seen? Yeah, yeah I think the whole <laughs> meaning making process, I go at it three different ways. The first way I usually go at it is asking them, here's what we're working on today. How in the world can you use this? When could you use this? How could you use this? So I really work pretty hard to pull it out of them as much as I possibly can. And then I'll slip little things in here and there. But I think that's really critical that they wrestle with it in some way. At times I'll share personal experiences, you know, how I might have used something in some way. But often even at the end of lessons, I'll come back and say, we just worked on all this today. I mean, I hope it was interesting for you. But how can you use this in some way? You know, where is it going to be? So. I'm agreeing with your disagree. I think it's it's best coming from them, for sure. Yeah. Okay, go. Well, I just wondered about your premise that, that it's inherent to humans to use reasoning or choose to use reasoning in process. I mean, if you look at choices about going to war or elections or whatever, you just wonder if that's inherently how people approach thinking about things. Yeah, good point. Good point. I'm not supposed to agree with these disagrees, but that's a good point. All right, how about some examples then? Just something that, kind of out of your life, your experiences as teachers or as people, you know, that, that just rings true in what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, like, you know, we're focusing on, like, a, top, a lot of times, but, like, intercultural competence or things like that, a lot of times you have to first uh, establish that this is a personal topic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's... Um, there's things that, you know, uh, there's conceptions about what this is about that students will just kind of write that off. Mm -hmm. So more of the same. So you have to kind of get through that and establish that there's mm -hmm. some meaning that's really important before they are open. Yeah, good point. Other examples? Yes, please. Um, I like something that was just in uh, middle school over here. And we had a class on the emotion. It really does play a huge thing. The teacher's emotion for the day, it totally plays off onto the students. Um, and how, I mean, just being aware of that and how you are acting as well. It's very important to for all get one more if we could. Yeah, I really want to respect the time if we could. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, on the first day of class, you talked about not knowing students. Yeah. And I know what finally makes it work for me is if I'm handing something back and I'm walking around the room and handing it to them and putting the face with the name, mm -hmm. then it finally sticks. And until then, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. It's you've got to use it. You've got to use that knowledge, you know, to, to really have it have it stick. Then. Yeah. Okay. I do want to wrap it up. We're right about at the time right now. What I'm hoping is. What we were just talking about, I hope you keep thinking about it, okay? So I hope it kind of haunts you a little bit and uh, keep reflecting on it. Forty minutes feels like a joke to me almost, <laughs> but, um, but it is what we have. So hopefully it got you started on some thinking a little bit too. Um, the other handout that you have with the strategies, um, like I said, put that near where you do your planning. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel like you're going to be talking really long without them doing too much, uh, that's often a really good place to try to bring some way to engage them in. So I think it's really helpful that way, too. And then uh, hopefully you can make it back to the other sessions. Um, this is uh, what we've got lined up. Um, invite some of your colleagues to come as well, too. Uh, I'll present a little information next time, but we're going to mostly work with things you've experienced. You've, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, obviously, with this kind of a topic. but. Um, I, I just want us to really wrestle with what a lot of those obstacles are for you, but also for your students, because you have many of them that really don't want to engage much. They prefer just to kind of sit there, you know, like a bump on the log. And what do you what do you kind of do with some of that? 
So we'll work with that too. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.